Hi everyone, thank you very much for being here. My name is Pashu Christensen, I'm with The Hive. And um, I'll speak very briefly the Hive, uh, about The Hive Think Tank. The Hive Think Tank is a community of practitioners, data scientists, engineers, thought leaders. Um, we have over 4,500 members in San Francisco Bay Area. We are one of the largest big data focused community in the world. So. Uh, we are really happy to be here tonight and uh, I'd like to thank uh, especially NEDAP for hosting us tonight. So they've been hosting a few events here. Some of you have joined us in the past. Um, we'd like to thank the AV team, the team from NEDAP uh, for having us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, the AV team is going to record the event and we will have post it on, we will post it on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So you'll get a chance to review the video, but also to share it online. And it's very high quality. So thank you. <laughs> uh, those are our upcoming events. Make sure to take good notes, but you will receive some emails from me about these events and you will be able to register online. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors tonight. Uh, we have two new sponsors, Cloudera and Mappa. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room from IBM? Cloudera? Mappa? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Microsoft? Teradata? HP, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Packing Squee, no. Well, th thank you to our sponsors and our partners as well. And uh, thank you to you for being here. You are making um, the Hive Think Tank, so thank you very much. And I'm gonna, I think you have a microphone. Uh, Ravi is going to introduce you to the Hive. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Pashu. Thank you, Pashut. So um, we'll quickly cut to the chase. I won't uh, bore you, but the Hive is uh, incubates, funds, launches companies in the big data space. Uh, we do seed stage financing. Um, oops. Um, uh, our focus, so we don't compete with all these gentlemen out here. Uh, our, our focus is on use cases and applications in different line of business functional areas or different vertical segments. And um, many of you know kind of the team. I wanted to, many of you know Lance, who's sitting somewhere. Lance, where are you? Uh, right there, Lance. And, and so I just wanted to introduce Mohan Reddy, who joined us earlier this week from uh, Zynga, where uh, he did architecture and is now our chief architect. So if you have a chance, say hello to him. Um, and many of you know Russell, and, and uh, uh, special thanks to Pashu and Erin who put this event together every week. Uh, and this time we had it, uh, one yesterday and one today. Yesterday's was on insurance and, and data. Um, those are some of the Hive startups, and I did see a few of the CEOs uh, here. I saw the CEO of Deep Forest Media. So it's a mobile advertising place, so go and talk to him if, if you're interested in the space. And very important, uh, be a part. I see many people tweeting, but uh, if you don't use the hashtag HiveData, it's like a tree falling in the forest. No one knows that you're tweeting. <laughs> so be a part of the conversation and hashtag HiveData. And of course, if you, if you want to see all the exciting pictures uh, of the event today, join us on, on Facebook. As Pashu mentioned, uh, there'll be um, the YouTube, there'll be kind of the video YouTube of this. Unfortunately, we aren't uh, till we kind of figure out sort of solid networking. We we are not doing this live for um, for uh, people who are remote, but it is available on on YouTube. So with that, I'd like to introduce Val Berkovici, who's our host here at NetApp. NetApp has been incredibly generous with us at the Hive. In, in co-hosting many of these events. So, Val. Thank you, everyone. No slides. I'll keep this very short and sweet. 
Um, my role actually is working in the office of the CTO and guiding and directing our research investments. About five years ago, MapReduce Hadoop was the research topic, and I'm very eager now to see today what Beyond MapReduce is going to bring us. I have uh, one important key piece of information, particularly for those of you with laptops only, but also tablets and mobile phones. The Wi-Fi address, or the Wi-Fi network name here, is hidden, but uh, it's open. It's just NetApp lowercase, N-E-T-A-P-P. -P. So you won't see it advertised, but if you want to hook up on Wi-Fi, by all means, uh, join our, our very fast network that's not very busy at this time of night. And enjoy the event tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Al. So with, with that, I'm, I'm so excited. It's, it's um, like someone else said about Obama winning. I, I feel a thrill up my thigh. <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the panel today, it's really, I would say, it's hard to find a more distinguished uh, set of speakers around um, big data infrastructure. So what I'd like to do is just uh, have all our panelists come, including uh, Nick, who's from Gartner, who's the moderator for today's event. And uh, let us know when you want to have the Q&A. Great, great. We're going to hold the Q&A till the end. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Nick Hudecker. I work uh, at Gartner. I'm a research director on the information management team. So I get to talk about the companies these gentlemen represent uh, pretty much all day. So this is exciting for me as it is for you. Uh, I'd like to start with introductions, and then we'll, uh, we'll start with some of the questions. Hi, uh, I'm Matei Zaharia. I'm the CTO at Databricks, which is the company commercializing Apache Spark. Before that, I was actually a PhD student at UC Berkeley in the research lab that uh, started Spark. And it's very exciting to be bringing this, to, uh, you know, uh, bringing this out commercially now. Hi, I'm Shankar Venkatraman. I'm the distinguished engineer and the chief uh, architect for the Big Insights product, which is a Hadoop-based offering from IBM. And uh, it's very exciting for us. I've been on this journey for three years, and uh, it's been Hadoop has gone through its maturation process. And uh, excited to be to be here for uh, to talk about what the next steps are going to be. I'm Doug Cutting. I'm the chief architect at Cloudera, also an open source software developer. I'm MC Srivas. I'm a CTO and one of the founders of Mapar. Uh, before Mapar, I was at Google. We worked on search there, so. Uh, kind of good experience with big data for a long time now. Evening, folks. Uh, my name is Arun Murthy. I'm one of the founders of Hardworks. I've uh, been um, involved in the Hadoop project for a little over eight years now. Um, so it's been an interesting journey. Um, thanks to uh, NetApp and uh, the Hive for having us. And thanks to you guys for joining. I'm Milan Bandarkar. I'm a chief scientist at Pivotal. Again, like uh, Arun, I've been involved in uh, Hadoop uh, back in the Yahoo days uh, since 2005-2006. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So before we get into beyond MapReduce, I think it's important to understand the, the historical context, how we got here. Right? We're, we're 10 years now since the original Google MapReduce paper was published. And, and the world was quite a different place. So Doug, I'd like to direct this first question to you. What was it about MapReduce and, and the characteristics of the time that made it such a popular data processing model? Well, I think Google, um, for me personally, uh, uh, solved a problem that I was having. I was trying to process data um, on commodity hardware across uh, a number of machines um, and was finding it operationally onerous. Uh, that it was a full-time job just to keep things running, to allocate space, um, to monitor things and, and see when they'd gone down. Uh, and uh, when the Google published those papers, uh, they were basically describing the same data flow that I was already doing, the same way of partitioning uh, and processing data, um, uh, but with an automated framework to manage the storage and to manage um, uh, computations, um, uh, sequencing computations, failure of computation, um, so that you could 
pretty much uh, run it hands off, um, uh, which would be a lot better because then I could do more development. Um, this was within a project called Nutch. Um, uh, so I uh, was very excited and, and went about uh, implementing it. I, I, there was a lot of um, buzz in the industry about the papers. Everybody thought they were, they were very cool work, um, but it was cool in the abstract in that you could read about it and say, wouldn't it be cool to work at Google? But if you didn't work at Google, it wasn't really uh, relevant. Um, and uh, I thought that if we had an open source implementation, um, lots of people could uh, more easily perform this sort of scalable distributed processing on commodity hardware. So. Milan, I'd also like to direct this question to you as well, uh, as far as since you were involved fairly early right. uh, in this process. What was it about MapReduce for you? Yeah, so it was basically Yahoo Search. Uh, Yahoo had acquired a company called Ink to Me at that time. And uh, Ink to Me is a content engine, which basically consists of the indexer pipeline, the web map framework, uh, et cetera. They were all running on you know, uh, organically developed software there. So the idea was uh, to bring all these, the, the entire indexing pipeline together. So in fact, in, when I joined in 2005, uh, in a team that was called uh, Juggernaut, uh, which was to replace the earlier framework for building the web maps at Yahoo called uh, uh, that that earlier framework used to call Dreadnought. So we started working on a Juggernaut uh, in the summer of 2005, and we we started building. And Google MapReduce uh, papers have, had come up, and we basically said, guess what? This is the right technology to bring all these indexing pipelines, the, the entire content engine back together into a single cluster. So we, we started working on that. Obviously, software has its own gravity. It's very difficult to change. So three years later, the entire search indexing pipeline was actually ported over to Hadoop. Uh, uh, but uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, we basically abandoned this framework called Juggernaut. We noticed uh, that there was this open source project called Nutch Distributed File System and Nutch MR. And we basically convinced Doug to uh, separate it out of Nutch, make it into its own project, so that Yahoo, which had its proprietary search engine, their engineers could contribute to it because we could not contribute to Nutch and we could not contribute to Lucene because we had our own proprietary search engine, right? And so that was that was the motivation behind adopting Hadoop uh, at that time. But uh, in the meanwhile, before the entire search index, index pipeline was was ported over to Hadoop, uh, we basically had uh, a starved of hardware group of people that basically wanted to do applied machine learning on the data corpus that they had. They did not have a scalable uh, infrastructure in order to run those algorithms. And so we offered Hadoop running as a service on a 600 machine cluster called uh, Kryptonite. And that's where those uh, uh, users were onboarded and started porting their pipelines. So uh, that's, that's how we basically got started with Hadoop and MapReduce. So it, would, it was practical, help you solve problems that you couldn't solve in other ways. Uh, and, absolutely, and, absolutely. And being open source let, let you basically do really what you wanted. Yep. with it. Absolutely. And, and a key part of the scale, right? I mean, yeah. you know, Milan talked about web map. To give you guys an idea of the scale we were dealing with at that point, you know, I think Constantine, who was one of the early engineers, wrote up a, a design doc, a requirements doc. And the requirements doc in 2000, was it five or six? six. It basically said, we want to scale to 10,000 machines and store whatever, I forget the number, you know, petabytes of data, right? And web map, when we actually went to production in 2008, this was sort of the single app or set of apps or this pipeline, which, which eventually produced you know, like 300 terabytes of data compressed. This was a single application or a single pipeline producing 300 terabytes of data compressed in 2008, right? So I think what's key, what is the key part of MapReduce is that uh, you know, Google showed how that you could actually do massive data processing at scale. And I kind of think of web search as the quintessential big data problem, right? Sure. So time has passed, and now we have several options for data processing and access on Hadoop. Mm -hmm. right. And we've got DBMS options, SQL options, as well as new things like Spark, uh, mm -hmm. Search, uh, Storm for stream processing. So what's driving this, right? It seemed like Hadoop had its niche, right? It was really good at that. And now people are just dropping whatever they want onto this stack. 
So, so Shrankar, maybe you can you can start with this. So, what, what's driving so, it? So, so it's interesting, right? When he started, when Hadoop started, it was it could do MapReduce, okay, and slowly it has started to evolve into a true heterogeneous compute platform, okay. And once the file system underneath HDF has stabilized to a point where we can throw any type of data and all volumes of data into it, then people started to focus at what the execution engines were, and which is where all the stabilization around YARN and everything else is starting to happen. Right? And that basically gave us the, the sort of the substrate which you needed from a highly scalable heterogeneous compute platform for us to put multiple types of workloads and multiple types of engines operating on the same underlying data substrate. Okay? The fundamental problem has always been data comes in multiple types and shapes, Absolutely. and you cannot force the shape to fit into a single rectangular shape all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Hadoop really is solving in, a f in, in the future, right? Essentially, with the advent of the stabilization of HDFS and the advent of YARN, we now have a substrate on which we can truly put heterogeneous workloads on a single, single substrate. So you mentioned HDFS. Yeah. That seems to be the, the common denominator here. Is, is that really what matters in the Hadoop stack today? Is everything else fungible, replaceable? It's not that mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, HDFS, so if you look at Hadoop, right, the, or any big data, there's two parts. There's data and then there's processing. Processing is easy to move around. It doesn't have inertia. Data is very difficult to do that with, right? It's very, very hard. I mean, in fact, NetApp is a data company, and, you know, uh, it's a very hard problem. That's why, you know, they, are, they exist. And... Uh, it's a very, you know, at Google it was a very hard problem as well. And uh, if you don't get it exactly right, because the bar of, of reliability and, you know, what, correctness for data is so high now, right? If you, if you get an email where the bits are twiddled slightly, you're going to stop using that email system, right? If you, you know, today uh, the, 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 the reliability needs are so high that, and plus the volume is so much that, and when you talk about volume and variety, uh, you just need to be able to manage that amount. So yes, the file system is critical. It's a, one of the most critical parts of, of any distributed framework. One is the file system to make data ubiquitous, ubiquitously available. The second part is the processing framework. And as you can see, there's lots of processing frameworks that are out there, like SparkShark is one of them, Yarn is one of them, there's Mesos, Mesosphere, there's, sorry, Mesosphere is the company, sorry. Mesos, there's a uh, platform computing from IBM, there's, there's lots of frameworks. Uh, but uh, I think the file system is definitely key, I think, because of the inertia it has. Yeah. Doug, do you have something to add there? Or I, I was going to try to more directly answer your question. Uh, not not, not <laughs> <laughs> insulting anybody else. I'm sorry, that came out wrong. Uh, in that, I mean, I think there was just an overwhelming opportunity um, in that once you have a bunch of data in one place, and you have a bunch of inexpensive processors, um, then you start thinking about what can I do with this? I have all this computing power, I have all my data, which is hard to move, um, uh, and what can I do to take advantage of that? And then you get this explosion. I think falling out of that opportunity is simply this explosion of different kinds of processing frameworks. So, contradicting anything anybody else said. And I think one of the, one of the processing frameworks that's getting a lot of momentum right now is, is Spark, and I'd like to ask uh, Matai about where is Spark going? How is that going to, mm -hmm. to supplant MapReduce? Yeah, so, so um, basically our um, research group started looking at Hadoop and working with some of the earliest Hadoop users back in 2007. Uh, we worked with both Yahoo and Facebook and we saw a lot of the problems that early users were having. And the problems were always the same across users. They were basically, once you started putting data into HDFS or some other storage system, uh, and you started doing basic computations on it, you wanted to do more advanced computations, more complex pipelines, and you wanted to do them faster. So in, in the research world, uh, even at Google, uh, there's been a lot of ev evolution of processing paradigms after MapReduce. Back in uh, 2007, Microsoft was publishing Dryad, which is a general task execution model that extended MapReduce. And in 2009, we started working working on Spark, which adds fast data sharing as well. The specific goal of Spark is to actually unify a lot of the workloads that require separate systems today, like SQL, stream processing, machine learning, and batch processing, and let you do them in one system so you can easily combine and manage them. So yeah. the unification is an interesting idea here, because we're certainly not seeing that today. 
-hmm. We've got Hive and Tez. We have Impala. We have a variety of different options. Uh, Aaron, your company works on, on Tez mm -hmm. uh, pretty heavily. So how is that fundamentally different than what Spark is bringing to the table? Well, I think Mujay talked about uh, you know Dryad, right? Dryad was actually a pretty you know pretty inspiration was, was actually a pretty big inspiration. I don't think Microsoft actually gets enough credit for it. Um, you know, everybody talks about Google and MapReduce, but I think you know Microsoft needs to get more credit for what they did with Dryad. The key part was it was I mean anybody who's worked on MapReduce and you know you didn't need to work on MapReduce for eight years to know that. Um, is that MapReduce at its heart is a very, very fundamentally simple paradigm, right? You got, you know, step one, which is massively parallel data processing. We're talking about terabyte, terabytes to petabytes, right? And then you got step two, which is I want to aggregate that processing. But in reality, you know, any any real world data application that you need to run needs more than this, these these two simple steps. Now what's happened, you know, if you step back, right, what happened was MapReduce was a Java API, but then to help more, you know, to help onboard more people onto Hadoop, you know, Hive came along, which provided the SQL layer, Pig came along, which provided a sort of simple data flow model, and then Cascading came along, which is a, you know, a more complex Java API on top, right? But all of them could only use MapReduce, right? And for somebody who's been working MapReduce for, for a long time, for me, MapReduce was three different things, right? It was, at the base, it was actually a system to take a bunch of applications, do resource management, fault tolerance, and so on. And you step up, it became an engine, you know, in, almost in spite of itself, right? Um, it became an engine for Pig and Hive because that was the only scalable system around. And then it was also the API for end users. Now, obviously, you fast forward now, you have uh, Yarn, which replaces MapReduce as a system. You have many, many engines and then you have many, many APIs. So going forward, we'll see lots and lots of these things, and particularly, you know, you know Storm is a really good example, right? Twitter had a really, really core problem of trying to, so to run all these tweets. If you look at the volume of tweets there, you're talking about millions per second, right? So you need a specialized engine. By the end of it, you know, like Doug and Shivas were saying, you don't want another system to store that data or process it, to st at least store the data, because you want to, eventually you want all the data in, the, in one place. So I think that was the genesis of Yarn, which allows us to run these multiple engines. And having these engines gives people more options, and it gives people more abilities to you know, process data. Does anyone else want to add any color here yeah, to, sure. to the different processing models that, that yeah, we're seeing? So uh, I think the main thing is that, uh, I think, for, I mean, not to say that no, we, we ship Spark, so let me color it that way. but. Spark is great as long as everything is in Spark's format, right? I mean, if it's not, then you don't get the benefit, right? So really, when you say variety of data, you have to really deal with data that's not in any, any particular format, right? You have to de deal with data as it arrives in situ, that is, in the form it is. That's the power that MapReduce actually brought, is that you could plug in different kinds of different parsers and figure out automatically what it was, going, you know, what it was doing. Uh, I think... Uh, Going forward, I think we are seeing a lot of different processing frameworks as well, but it's important to know that there's a lot of uh, real-world processing is not always in, in, you know, is ever going to be in one language. People are going to do Python, Ruby. There's more Python and Ruby than Java today. Even more than that is C. So the need to support other languages in their native format is very important, right? Not just, uh, so if you really look at the business problem somebody's trying to solve is they say, hey, I have a bunch of data. I have data coming in from sensors, from uh, web clicks, from whatever way, and I need to process it quickly, whether it's Twitter or something else. So providing a more general framework that lets you run uh, all kinds of things is really the most unbiased way of doing things. I mean, I, you know, I know all my compatriots here are talking about data like lake or hub or whatever, but the point is that uh, to be able to get to that data, you have to allow uh, universal access. I mean, that is really the core here. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I think uh, it, there's there's some evolution needed still out there. But 
I'm sorry, go ahead, after you. I would just like to add uh, you know, one, one thing to, uh, to, to clarify things a little bit since the question was about Spark. So uh, you know, one, one thing that the Hadoop ecosystem did extremely well, and I think we have Doug to thank for it, is that uh, they have a standard interface for input into MapReduce from any storage system. All the systems you see other than HDFS, all the file formats on HDFS use the same interface. And this is the interface we used in Spark to let you access uh, exactly the same data sources. And I think between this and projects like H Catalog for structured data, it, uh, it creates a lot of room for different engines. Um, I'll also say as someone who is not trying to sell multiple systems that uh, we really do want uh, to have a single processing system that you manage and install because we see in many users there's substantial complexity to managing and learning different systems. So that is, you know, we're here to do sort of the, the um, look at the, the future of MapReduce and that is something that I think we will see in the industry in the future is actually consolidation. So you have to trade. Uh, so just, just to add on that, right? You have to trade performance in order to get flexibility. MapReduce focused more on flexibility, mm -hmm. and the access to different languages actually did not happen by moving beyond MapReduce. It actually happened by just creating a small framework called Hadoop Streaming, which basically says you can program in any language as long as you can read it from STDN write it to a study out, you can write your MapReduce programs in that, right? You've seen MapReduce being abused uh, to launch various kinds of applications, mm -hmm. even when there was no yarn. I've seen MPI I've been, applications, I've taken the, I've taken the MPI calls. applications being launched as map-only applications, and, and then they did some crazy things, right? So I think- I've the, taken the support calls, you know <laughs> the, that. So, so there is, the, the layering that was introduced, I think from the beginning to, to make processing more flexible, and then even resource management more flexible, or uh, uh, programming on top of this cluster more flexible. I, th I think we are going to see a continuum of that, yeah. and that, that's where things are going. So you're talking about flexibility, and there is a trade-off there, performance. Yeah. And it seems from, <laughs> seems from where I sit, Hadoop is getting a lot of the trappings of the relational database, right? We're seeing DDL emerge, we're seeing different types of processing models, a number of SQL implementations. Uh, why not just use a relational database in SQL? Mm -hmm. well, so so it, it, this goes back to the first point. I had to throw him a softball. Yeah. <laughs> so th this goes back to the first point which I was trying to make, right? It's the power of Hadoop is essentially, it doesn't define a shape and format for the data, right? Relational databases by virtue of, and Mohan will kill me if I say this, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is, uh, uh, relational databases by virtue of being rectangular in nature, force you to actually stick to certain specific data types. And anything which goes out of the data types, you actually have to go do UDFs and everything else, right? And that is a fundamental, pro and at that point you lose fidelity of the data. Okay, the problem here is that there's so much data coming in for, into applications these days that you need to preserve the raw fidelity of the data so that you can actually get to the true application value in analytics later. There's, there's lots of things which I think you can't do very effectively in a relational database. And so having a, a wider palette of tools uh, is, is, I mean, I, search is what I, what I came from. Uh, and uh, full text search is done very poorly in relational mm -hmm. databases. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can be done so, orders of magnitude better. So I would um, give a counterpoint there, which is relational databases do some things very, very well. That's why there's like, you know, the bulk of the data processing happens in relational databases today. So they have their sweet spot and it's a very good sweet spot. But there's a bunch of data that doesn't fit into foreign key constraints, right? You can't sit down and say, okay, everything has to have a you know, if an employer record exists, you know, the person has to exist or something like that. I mean, that doesn't, that's not real world. But, uh, so, but there's, but if that does happen, then relational is fantastic, right? So this is the reason why Oracle is as successful as it is. But, yeah, yeah, give me one moment to finish. <laughs> so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that the, this is what I was talking about in the earlier thing, which is you need to allow more kinds of processing than just MapReduce or Java or something. And this is kind of one of the reasons why MapR actually announced, you know, Vertica running on MapR, right? Is to allow the kind of extremely good processing that you can get from a relational database. You, today, you know, Hadoop is not there yet. It'll get there. That's what I mean by saying it has to evolve. But right now, it's not there. And, and in the meantime, the people have the problem today. Uh, so what does a relational, and then it comes back to the data issue earlier, which we talked about, which is a relational database will not run on something that's unreliable. 
right? You, you need the level of guarantee that an oracle provides, right? And so we're coming back to the HDFS kind of uh, issue there, right? One is going to kill you. Like, which, which one? You know, <laughs> or DB2 <laughs> provides, sorry, excuse me. Talking about transactional or analytical, right? Uh, well, they're both important, right? The data is, finally, it's a business need. Yeah. So being, trying to be more general purpose is actually very important. Okay, so, so my, my view on that is that, you know, there is a summit, there is a perfect data system, right, out there. The relational databases and really? their uh, OLAP, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and the, the uh, online analytical uh, uh, processing databases, right? They are, they are climbing that summit from one, one side, and Hadoop has been climbing that from the other side, right? Eventually, you know, both the goal of both of those things is to reach there. Now, what we are doing today is basically digging tunnels in this mountain so that we can basically move, you know, people from this side to that side and vice versa, right? All the SQL on Hadoop uh, movement that you have seen in the last two years are basically digging these tunnels between the relational databases side and the Hadoop side. I don't like the mountain model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I don't you know, know what the tunnel is. I think, I think long term we want to think more about uh, evolutionary, evolutionary systems uh, and, mm -hmm. and that there, the new, better things will arrive. Um, ideally, there will be some consolidation. I think mm -hmm. I very much agree with, with Matei that um, we don't want too many systems. I think we're, we're, we're verging on that right now. There's, there's a fair amount of redundancy and there needs to be some consolidation. Um, uh, but that's, I think that's fair within an, an evolutionary strategy. But the notion that there's one system that's going to rule them all uh, for all time, I don't buy. Um, I think we'll continue to see new things come up, and I think that's healthy. That's right. Uh, There'll be top three players. Point, on that point, I want to I want to bring up uh, the next question. And there is a lot of redundancy in these projects, right? And for almost everything that you can do in Hadoop, you have at least two options, right? So at least two. So I know that we're talking to the faithful, but outside of Silicon Valley, right? If we go East of Sacramento, yes. <laughs> are we are we are we talking about real value creation here, or is it just coders writing code? So I'll, I'll give you a good example. It's definitely cases. So I'm not. So I'm, I, we have a real life customer who actually spoke at a Hadoop user group and said they realized over a billion dollars of value every year running on a Mapper cluster. A billion dollars. And so I was saying, man, we undercharged them. <laughs> right? <laughs> but but they, they said that publicly. This is a very big uh, retailer. I th think there are certainly cases where um, competition has egged um, projects to uh, achieve things that they wouldn't have achieved otherwise, um, uh, you know, to add features and to take them seriously when they see something else that's competing with them. So I think having a couple um, can, be, can be very useful. Um, I'll give you another great example of Hive as well, right? I mean, when you say real value, there was an insurance company that uh, tried to run this uh, large query on fraud detection uh, on a Teradata. Took three weeks, the query wouldn't come back. They ran it on Hive, it came back in three hours. That query to, the, to them was worth $6 million. Just that one, it was a four page long, 25 table join. Right? If they had declared you but, as a half, it would have come back in three minutes. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I'm sure they tried, but at what cost? <laughs> right? So, yeah. go ahead. In terms of value, I'd like to add another thing, which also ties with the relational database discussion, which is just open source. I mean, these systems are commoditizing large scale storage, they're commoditizing large scale computation, and that's very disruptive, and it is valuable in the sense of just, uh, you know, benefit minus cost. So, that, that shouldn't be discounted. Well, that's so, true as long as you get the quality up, okay. right? Because yes, the disks are, you know, you can get a cheap storage system for $300 a, uh, you know, a terabyte or something cheaper than that, a managed terabyte, versus whatever else somebody's charging, which is, you know, maybe 100 times more, like an Oracle will charge 100 mm -hmm. times more, but can you get the same reliability? Unless you get it, people will not put the data there, they'll keep staying in Oracle, so, so right? Are you arguing that? Open source has inferior <laughs> quality to non-open source? Well, I'm saying Hadoop, HDFS, right now does have inferior quality compared to Oracle. I'm saying that. Hmm. You're comparing two different things, right? Yeah. You're comparing <laughs> the database well, versus no, 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 the storage. The question is relational system. database versus yeah, Hadoop. In terms again, of the quality matters. So, 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 so the, only, the only issue I'll take with that statement is yeah. Oracle does not manufacture a disk subsystem. Okay, they rely on NetApp no, no, to actually okay, provide the disruptions. Sorry, Their reliability have comes Have you looked from, at Exadata so, recently? Yeah, but the point is it still uses, uses the oh. underlying disrupt system from some other vendor, right? So, so let's be Sorry, careful here. Sorry, Exadata is not from... Okay, so... Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't see Exadata running on NetApp yet. 
No, I thought it runs on its own just subsystem. All right, let's, make, let's, let's refocus a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a question I get from my clients all the time, and I think there's a fair amount of confusion here. Uh, originally, Hadoop was something pretty small. You had a file system, you had MapReduce, and, and a little bit of common code between them. Uh, but now we're seeing the explosion of options on the Hadoop stack. So, so Doug, I'm going to target you for this one as well. <laughs> what is Hadoop today? <laughs> right, how do I define that? Um, well, there's a precise answer, which is it's a Apache, it's a, it's, a, it's a project at Apache, and it's whatever that project decides to produce. Isn't it a cons uh, conglomeration of several other projects? No. Pr technically, it is, it is the, whatever the Apache Hadoop project produces and releases, okay. um, which is today um, uh, HGFS, um, Yarn, MapReduce. Um, there's a few other components having to do with um, some shared authorization and, and authentication uh, facilities and, and so on. Um, uh, in many ways, I think it's analogous to a kernel um, uh, in, in an OS, um, and it's a kernel for a distributed OS that, that manages um, storage, uh, manages users, um, uh, manages uh, sharing uh, processors and memory. Uh, and like some OSs, uh, the whole ecosystem that's built on the OS is oftentimes called by the name of, of its kernel. Um, uh, so you know, we, when we say Linux, we don't usually mean just the the kernel project, which is actually what it means, um, uh, but we mean the ecosystem of things that run on the Linux kernel. Um, and so I so think it's a similar, similar confusion here, um, is that it, you know, it can mean either thing. Uh, in the narrow sense, um, it means the Apache Hadoop project. In the broader sense, it means the set of things which are built on top um, and depend on Apache Hadoop. Does that make sense? It does. Do you um, so, um, would I include Hive as something that builds on and depends on, on uh, no, no, Hadoop? No, but as Hadoop, you wouldn't, or you would? Hive is not Hadoop. No, I would not, I would not say that's a true sentence. Okay. So, okay, I, I wanted <laughs> to just a, put as, the... As a standalone... All right. Okay, I, I get what you're um, saying. Um, Hive is an element of the Hadoop ecosystem. Please. I'd say that. But in the, in the broadest sense, what it's, gonna, what it's meaning to be now is that it's, it's a platform to store data and process data. I think that's, you know, the kernel point, which is increasingly we'll see not just you know, open source projects like Hive and, you know, Spark and Tez and all these things on Hadoop. But we'll see, you know, many, many, many proprietary platforms run, in, you know, run on Yarn, for example, right? They'll have access to data in HDFS. They'll have access to, you know, metadata in Edge Catalog. They'll, act, they'll have access to resources and have access to storage. Um, and that's actually a sign of maturity for the project, right? Because it's easy to say, you know, it's, it's always easy as, you know, open source developers to say, this is what it was six years ago. We'll try to be. We'll try to be stay true to our roots, right? I think it's. Um, we need to sort of. Obviously, I'm you know, you know, touting my own horn as part of the Apache Hadoop project. But I think Apache Hadoop project gets needs to get credit for the fact that it realizes that it needs to be much more than just X or Y, if it needs to stay relevant going forward, right? I mean, you know, for 2000, you know, five 2006, HDFS and MapReduce were great, but that's not going to be true for 2014 or for 2024. So, so Nick, uh, uh, Gardner publishes this, you know, curve of adoption, right? And big data is listed somewhere near the top of that. Uh, just, just going to oh, the enter. hype cycle. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Last year, big the the so, notion of big data was right. near the so, peak. So, if, yes. if if Hadoop has to survive that trough of disillusionment, it needs to be very flexible about what is Hadoop, right? right. And so we can take out HDFS, push in MapR. It's still Hadoop, right? Take out, uh, let's say. Are we talking to the ESO? No, I, I'm, I'm saying Hadoop as in not Hadoop TM, but what <laughs> people understand to be Hadoop, Better. right? You know what that's, that's basically the thing. No. So, uh, Colonel, yeah, I, right. I, I like Doug's definition very well. Why? Because he's defining as a framework and of, of a core set of what an operating system does, right? Like an operating system, I can plug and replace different file systems, I can plug and replace different processing frameworks, but it provides the glue to run the whole thing together. I really like that, that definition, I think. Uh, and you can plug in you know, different languages, sure, I can run C or Python or whatever on Linux. So can I on, uh, on Hadoop in the future, right? Yeah, sure. And that, that language binding and API binding needs to start to happen. The one problem which we have with Hadoop right now is every application you build on Hadoop is a custom application. 
Okay. So that's why so, we did drill, so, right? So, that's so, kind of the reason why we did drill to so, federate that. But the, but still, it's Nepalchi, still yeah. it's still one of one of the many options which are there. And the fact is, there's no classical. So the way I want to compare this is, it's like an app server and a and a database built into one. And the app servers really got really uh, got traction once you had a bunch of applications running on these multiple app servers with an application framework sitting on top. And that is the place where I think Hadoop would need to evolve. Yeah, it will be layered and then people yeah. will basically plug in different layers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I should be able to run the most famous thing in the Apache, right? The Apache HTTP daemon yeah. on Hadoop. Yeah. Why not? Why can't I do that? Well, right? I should be able to don't, do that. Don't do that. It's way too hard for me that's to That's way too hard for you to say. <laughs> we, have, we are running that. Yeah. Well, that's so, happening with Yarn. It, it, it is happening. Um, and it, you're not helping my, my position. <laughs> <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> So, but with, it, with the introduction security. of all of these new processing models that are not as mature as the file system that they run on or MapReduce and best practices haven't really emerged yet, is Hadoop, by including these things, even in an amorphous sense, is it becoming less mature? I mean, maturity is a, a process, or maturation is a process, right? Um, uh, so I, what I look more to is, are people finding utility? And I argue they are. We're seeing more and more adoption of these tools um, as the years go by. Um, and as that happens, as they're adopted, uh, they get more and more mature. Um, uh, you know, by the time you're fully mature, you're dead. So you, you kind of don't want to get there. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> so let, let me talk to that, right? I mean, one of the first things that we did at Greenplum starting 2011 is basically took the 10-year-old mature Greenplum database code base, right, and ported it to run on top of Hadoop. Did that make Hadoop more mature or less mature? I, th I think it made, made it more mature, because now you could have a true MPP database engine with full ANSI SQL compatible, uh, ANSI SQL, right, running on top of Hadoop. So mm -hmm. it, it did make it mature. We did the same thing with the Gemfire. We took the Gemfire in-memory database engine for that developed over the last uh, 10 years, we ported it to run on top of Hadoop using HDFS as its storage, giving native in-memory capability to run on top of Hadoop. So that, I think, in my opinion, it made it more mature. And, and we'll see add, more and more such things. And to add to what he's saying, we are seeing that same trend see in other parts of the ecosystem, right? Uh, you see business intelligence tools starting to do that. We see uh, analytical tools starting to do that. We see classical ETL tools starting to do that, where they're actually saying, let me go and replatform myself, so to speak, Okay, to run inside the Hadoop ecosystem to actually run as part of a, as, as a component inside the system as opposed to me being the center of the world. So that is the maturation which is starting to happen. The, the most common complaint I hear these days um, is what I think of as really a, it's a, su a success disaster. Um, it's that uh, people complain that be they, you've got all these tools and they're all wonderful, but they're not seamlessly integrated. Um, uh, and and that's, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a good problem to have. It means that people are finding the platform useful. They want them to be integrated. Um, they're buying into the vision. We're just not quite there yet. Um, so. and, and to your point, I think it's actually a fair point. It says if you have sort of, you know, if, if you look at Hadoop as a, an operating system and you look at these you know, different engines as you know, tools or applications, you know, I use Linux in 95, or I, don't remember, I can't remember now, and it was a pain to use. So what I did was say, you know, it was hard to distinguish between the application and the platform. And that's, I think that's part of reality, which is something that we have, to, we as part of the Hadoop community have to be aware of, which is if we do, ha we have too many immature tools, people will reject the platform. And it's, a, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we not only have a, a really good platform, but also a really good set of applications. And I think that's going to be part of the natural evolution as all of these different engines come and there'll be consolidation of two or three or, you know, eight. Right. Yeah, actually, that kind of comes back to what you were saying earlier. Hey, we have two of everything on Hadoop. What's going on, right? Which is kind of you open that, and and that's exactly right, because you have two because you have a choice. And you know, the guys who did the second one found some problem with the first one, build something new, and it keeps evolving. And so, yeah, today what's great, maybe not so good tomorrow. Right. But as long as the data formats are the same, they follow the same, some kind of put it in, in the Hadoop storage system, and put it, you know, in a way that other tools can interact with it, then you have a nice evolution going on. Right? As long as they start putting it into their own, what I say, proprietary for format, then you get into trouble, which is why I disagree with actually Milland. They say, I put it into Gemfire format, evolved Hadoop. No, it doesn't. 
Jamfire it's in some have its own format. Jamfire uses Sage-based format. MapRFS is an entirely a public format on the disk. <laughs> <laughs> the format is completely transparent. MapR doesn't say a format. The data format no, is no, not inside the, the file system. No, no, I think, I think the file should, system is yeah. transparent, right? Yeah. So it's as much proprietary as uh, you know, ext3 or ext4 is. Do you look inside ext4 format? You never do. You can, but you don't. So right? okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me clarify something. <laughs> let me clarify something. Hawk is a proprietary. SQL engine, but uses Parquet as its underlying format, which is an open source format, right? Gemfire is a proprietary in-memory database that uses age-based file format for persistence, okay? So you don't get locked in. That's very clear to me, right? You don't get locked into the data format. Yes, You could absolutely get locked not. into the, the software. Into yeah, the, the software people are paying no, for because it is on. good. HPS doesn't have a format, right? In the sense that if I put something inside an HPS cell, there is H5, no format. H file v2 is the format that HBase uses for persistence. That's the same format that Gemfire uses for persistence. If, come on, man. HBase doesn't have a format in any cell. All right, let's, okay. let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's bring it back a little bit. Uh, I, have, I have one final question that I really want to open it up for the audience for questions. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm hoping this one will be fun. Simpler. <laughs> if, you, if you had a magic wand and you could do anything you wanted to the Hadoop stack, Introducing something new, fixing something, uh, getting rid of some some technical debt. What would you do? Right? There's no opportunity cost here. You just get to do it. So, Millen, what would you what would you do? Uh, separate the state from all the demons uh, outside of all these demons. Right? Uh, we basically are stuck into a single or maybe a few few name nodes because name node basically holds all the state. I would like to move it out of there. The resource manager state. I would like to move it out of uh, out of there. The initial philosophy of uh, Hadoop and, and in general GFS and MapReduce, which is you know put all your eggs in one basket, but then watch that basket really carefully, right? That's the one that I would like to bring back. But now with that basket being a scalable in-memory state store, which will store all the state and all the demons will fetch the state from there. That will be the one big change that I would like to do there. We have started some activities in that by separate trying to. There is a Jira in HDFS uh, basically. Uh, uh, making the state store or the namespace pluggable. So the namespace pluggable basically means you can actually store your namespace in HBase. We have a work working prototype of that, right? And the name node is completely stateless now. It basically multiple name nodes just talk to the same HBase instance. As an operations person, I watch that HBase thing rather than multiple name nodes. So you have the other single point of failure. Hmm? <laughs> so you, you basically are... You build that, that store with the scalability guarantees that you need, that's pretty much it. Then you can develop multiple stateless uh, uh, masters, right? I would like to go towards stateless masters. Um, I have a slightly different, well, I don't know what I do now. I, some of it is, uh, you know, there are too many ideas at this point. But I'd like to go back in time if I could. I would go back in time and build something like Yarn uh, pretty early in the, in the you know, timeline of Hadoop. I think. Uh, as successful as Hadoop has been, um, it would have been, you know, potentially in a in a significantly more advanced state in terms of not just, you know, one or two map, you know, one or two uh, paradigms. We would have seen a lot more paradigms already, and would have actually seen a, you know, at this point we would probably have seen a consolidation of two or three already. We are sort of behind that curve. It's going to take us some more time, but I would actually, if I could, I'd go back and build something like Yarn uh, pretty early in, in Hadoop's lifetime. Well, but if you were to go back in time and build Yarn earlier, how do you know you would need it? <laughs> uh, because we knew it. Because we, you know, I was getting called at you know two or three in the morning saying my you know web web server app, which is running in a map only job, is not working. Right? So I'm, I'm giving you a magic wand, and you're telling me that you really want to just get more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it, I can respect that. Exactly. Can, yeah. right? So very interestingly, that's what we what Milan wants to do. We already did at Mapar, right? Yeah. So it's very <laughs> with with this thing. So, sorry, wow. but I don't know if I wave a magic wand. But we didn't do it in H space, of course. We we took the state out. In fact, that's how Mapar is actually a chain everything because it keeps the state out and and can recover anywhere, right? Everything is like that, and it's completely symmetrical. I don't believe in a central uh, metadata server. It doesn't scale. Google has. Okay, but, but, what anyway, but, but what would I do if I want to wave a wand, right? So I would like to get a little bit more, you know, a different kind of uh, 
compute kind of, can I get like, uh, you know, relational algebra is great for, for SQL, but I want to understand the other kind of processing, which is I think Stinger test is kind of going along that path, the, the data flow architecture kind of model. Uh, that's proven to be massively parallel and very fast. Uh, I think uh, it's still very cumbersome to deal with. And if you can get some kind of, uh, you know, like very good resource scheduling that can happen magically instantly, then I think that's, that's really required for Hadoop. Because right now, that, that's a still a, you know, area of exploration. That's I think. what we do with platform computing right now. So, 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 so we should be, probably talk later. To be, to be clear, Yarn can do an allocation less than a millisecond at this point. If, if you guys want to know how Alchemy can help. <laughs> do, 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 do you guys do JVM reuse? Yeah, yeah. actually we do. Yeah. In Tez we do. Yeah. Is it out? Yeah, it's yeah. part of Hive 13. It's part of Hive 13, yeah. Yeah, it's part no, of Hive 13. No, no, you said Yarn. Hive 13 or Yarn? Yarn doesn't know about JVMs. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right, Doug? So as I go back and I think about the mistakes that have been made, I, I can group them into two categories. Um, the ones which were completely unavoidable, which you know, we, we had to learn the hard way. Um, and the ones which were completely avoidable, but if I mentioned them, I'd uh, be putting salt in wounds and, <laughs> and make enemies that I do not need. You're among friends. Uh, no, nah, <laughs> not going to go there. Doug, no um, going to get you. So, uh, so I, I don't, I don't see anything that I would go back and change. Honestly, I, I think. Um, <laughs> but what? So, not change something, but what would you? But what, what would you I add? would do now is I would get Larry Ellison to loan us a, a Hawaiian island um, for a week um, and put everyone there without any computers uh, and have everyone talk and, and sort of come to a better understanding. I think there's a little too much uh, discord, uh, and I think we could all work much more in much more complimentary manners uh, if, uh, if we had a little more uh, healthy communication. So anybody knows Larry, they can talk to him. No when I would be used. No pressure. Uh, what, what is your, what is your I would, wish? I would, I would uh, look at security. Okay, this is the f so as you said, if you go east of Sacramento, the first question you get asked whenever you talk about Hadoop is security. Okay, and the, the, if I have a magic wand to go fix right today, that's where we will go fix. Okay, to get actually make it a comprehensive security security uh, layer, which actually goes across these multiple engines, so that each engine doesn't go and implement its own its own form of security, and then none of these engines ever talk to each other or believe each other's security. It's called like excess security. Yeah. We just bought. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so for me, I think, um, you know, looking at Hadoop and at the experiences we've had with it, uh, the most important thing still missing is actually standards. So having a standard SQL dialect across the different, different SQL engine, having a standard uh, metadata store, even having a standard for the programming interface. And standards are what create a platform rather than a thing where people are just coding and every few years they port the application forward. So actually, this is one of the things that we've been doing with Spark. We have a growing set of applications and we're offering them an interface that we guarantee will stay the same over future versions of Hadoop, over storage systems, even over non-Hadoop runtimes and storage. And I think that's, that's what needed to, uh, to make big data um, an actual ecosystem. Yeah. So you know who said that? In, I think Andrew Tannenbaum said this about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Said, "Oh, the nice thing about standards is there are so many of them. You can pick which one you want." <laughs> right? yeah. No, no, there, there I is. I mean, I mean, the there, problem is the standards evolve yeah. because there's a need that yeah. changes it. Right? There, there so you, you cannot have that. There is a as difference. A MC, so for example. When I learned to program, I actually wrote Windows applications. I wrote Windows applications 12 years ago. That's still hard today. Um, I cannot say the same thing about Hadoop. Uh, so this is, if you want a platform that lasts for that many years, this is the thing that's missing. And I think as Doug was saying, this is partly a matter of um, you know, the very fast success of Hadoop that uh, people were already investing in it before this had a chance but, to But solidify. why do you think it's changing? Is it because well, but, people but, want but, it? But to his point, I think the, the standards have emerged and they exist within HDFS. Yeah. That's, that's really the lingua franca yeah, that right is now. The, so that is the most solid one. Sure, yeah. HDFS yeah. API has become standards, right? Yeah, that that, is that has become standard. Yeah. I mean, SQL is And the standard. file format, I think. So, so, Which yeah. HDFS API? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an evolving standard, right? I mean, if, I mean, standards are useless if they just stay the same. <laughs> so, so the thing which I have, so in the case of SQL, okay, we have a standard. It's, it's the SQL standards body has a standard. Only thing is, 
SQL is, is unique because it's a standard without an implementation, without so, a reference implementation. So, 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 so that's the same thing. Which, which SQL, actually, right? No, You're basically yeah. 92, 2003, 2013. Not 2010. Exactly. So it's the same thing with HDFS API. As well. But it's worse because Hive has been to deal with unstructured data as well, which is not covered by that standard, so, and that's so, where things so, really so, start. Which is why SQL MR and all these things. Which is standards are useful when you have when you want to encourage competing implementations. I think that's what they're really designed for. Yeah. I think with open source. Uh, you can have um, a single implementation many times that is a, effectively a, a, a de facto standard. Yeah. Um, then you have the issue, which I think you're raising more, which the is that compatibility yeah. yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, within an, an API and an open source uh, thing. And I think you know, we're, 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 we've learned not to change APIs much. I think early in projects, they often change them because they can afford mm -hmm. to. And as the projects mature, yeah. um, uh, yeah. they change them less. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe Spark has been better about changing them less. Uh, than uh, MapReduce through the years. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying. I'm just saying this is the issue you know, we observed. And it's, it, it is a thing that slows down the ecosystem. There's no question. If you have to change your application to move across vendors, that will slow it down. So Spark changed its API between 0 0.7 and 0 0.7.1. No, it, it did not. No. OK. No, we've had you guys no, can, You guys no, can discuss this uh, yeah. offline. No, no API <laughs> changes like, other like than moving cats. it into Apache. Or just, to, you know, yeah. just as an example, right? So yeah. MapReduce, for example, um, you know, like Doug said, in the early part of the project, you have to change. Because if you don't, you, you learn new stuff, right? I mean, you don't, you, you don't grow up, you know, I, I'm a believer in uh, evolution and not creation, creationism. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to evolve because you know, things change, realities change, assumptions change. Um, and use cases change. So you have to evolve, but you know, MapReduce, for example, today, you can take a Hadoop 1 application, run it completely unmodified in Hadoop 2. Uh, it's taken a lot of work um, and a lot of sleepless nights, but I think it's been worth, worth the effort to have that because we can now actually seamlessly go to a customer and, and move him from Hadoop 1 to Hadoop 2, and more importantly, he can have a Hadoop 1 cluster and Hadoop cluster simultaneously and still run the same application. So those are my questions. Uh, I'd like to open it up for your questions. This microphone. We have a microphone in the back uh, or in, in the middle aisle there. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I see from the industry, uh, many people talk about data lake. And everybody's definition and everybody's idea of data lake is different. Companies like Squirrel are coming, Accumulo, and everybody are coming from a different end. What are your personal views on data lake, and what is it trying to solve, and how are you, your companies trying to work in that space? I'd really like to know about that. My least favorite topic ever, data lakes. <laughs> I, I, I can make it quick. Um, uh, I, I, we, we, at Cloudera, we, we call it the enterprise data hub, is the term we, uh, we prefer to data lake, but I think it's, it usually often mean, means the same thing. What we might mean by that um, is simply um, uh, the entire ecosystem. Um, uh, to try to give it a name that's a little, little more functional, um, that it's a place where you can um, put lots of different kinds of data together in one place and then have a wide variety of tools um, uh, that, that talk to them. And the storage, the, the, the nice thing about removing Hadoop from the name is you can change the storage. Um, you can change which engine you use to process it um, uh, and, and so on. And, and it's, just, it's more the concept, the architecture of um, combining lots of different forms of data in one place with a variety of tools. And just, to, so, just, just to kind of add to it, I think one of the key, key things that we've learned with Hadoop is having a common namespace is really important. This way, you know, different uh, sub-organizations within your large enterprise can put data in that one namespace. And it doesn't become, you know, I used to be at Yahoo, right? It, it would take us six months to get data from search to bed housing, right? If you want to join the search you know, data from somebody else's data, it would take us six months because we had to you know, go through the organization change. And by the time you got the data in one place, the insight you get from it would be useless because the world has moved on. So having that one namespace and multiple options to process that data is really important. Yeah. So uh, our, our, yeah. our definition basically is, uh, you know, uh, you are, we, are, we don't expect you to throw away your existing storage investment just because you can actually move on to HDFS, right? You want to bring in those storage investments as well into the same namespace using multiple APIs. And those APIs are now getting sort of standard. S3 API is almost standard. Uh, S3 is standard. Swift is standard. Uh, HDFS is standard, almost, right? So as long as you can pool all those resources and create a single namespace on top of that, that's your uh, data.
Yeah. And don't forget the NetApp standard, NFS. Oh, yeah, yeah. NetApp yeah. is already there. So, so uh, I, from, a, from an IBM perspective, what we have seen is, yes, we get all the data together, but ultimately you have to sort of curate the lake to make it livable for the fish inside. So essentially, uh, <laughs> essentially what we are going forward with is the lake is a place where you can actually bring in all forms of data, but there's also has to be some level of curation so that you actually can extract out the right pieces of information for you to usefully uh, uh, use it in other, other applications on top. Okay. So if you must use the, the data lake metaphor, our advice is to think about it as a data reservoir that you actually have management and control in, not just a dumping ground. And so what's your don't, fishing tool? Don't let the right. lake become a swamp. That's, that's effectively what he said. Hi, uh, so I have a question on yarn. So somebody mentioned earlier that it's, it's kind of hard to move the data because of the inertia between the data centers. Do you guys see the need to move the compute where data is? In other words, if I have multiple data centers, if my data is, a, I mean, um, you know, spread across the data centers, do you, see the, do you see the need for, you know, in the Yarn framework to bring the compute to that data and then take advantage of all the resources across the data centers? Today, most probably what's happening is somebody has to bring all the data to a particular data center and run your MapReduce and you're, taking, you're not taking advantage of all the resources across the data sense. So my question is, do you guys see that need and if, if it does, what's happening in that space? So let me give you the MapR answer where we have done mirroring, full read-write mirroring. So you can run two data centers, take whatever data you want, mirror it to the other side, completely consistent mirror. You can run a database, for example, you can even run Vertica or DB2 or anything else and put it there. And it's fully writable, right? So you can now, now do your processing, whether it's Yarn. I mean, Yarn is just the processing engine. Yarn doesn't do MapReduce, right? Yarn is just scheduling resources. Correct. So now you really don't want to run MapReduce across two data centers unless you have infinite bandwidth between the two data centers, right? So I, I'm, I'm assuming you're not saying that. No, right? no, what I'm saying is that let's say you have 100 servers here and then you have 100 servers there. So you want to, ideally, you want to run on 200 servers. I mean, not on 100 so servers. Your data. But so, so the data could be anywhere across the data centers. The reason people have multiple data centers is for redundancy. And so you want to have each data center capable of uh, handling all the load on its own. Um, uh, and so that, that's this issue of um, uh, needing to spread the load across would put you into this situation which you couldn't sustain a data center failure if you, if you required to the, the resources of two to, to process. So that's, a, that's kind of a lame answer. Um, it's, it's also very hard to spread computations across uh, multiple data centers. You've got significant time delays. It's a hard, hard technical problem. Some systems, it depends on what kind of processing you're doing. Some systems are more amenable to it than others. Um, uh, search is a problem, which is you could, you can um, uh, you know, run confederate across um, data centers. Um, other kinds of things, MapReduce is something that's probably not going to work very well. So it, it depends. So, 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 so the, the answer I would add to this is this, right? Like what Sriva said, like you can replicate and, and uh, actively manage files across multiple data centers, data across multiple data centers. What you probably are trying to look for is, can I actually manage my workload so that I can push my workload from one data center to the other dynamically based on availability of resources so that I can actually have better utilization across both these data centers. There you go. Okay, so if that's what you want, that is essentially a case where you need to be able to literally beg, borrow, and steal resources across both data centers for your specific resources, which is essentially all on the YARN resource management layer, which is not yet there, but effectively that's what you are looking for. Correct. Except that if that's you want it. to push the processing, you, you got to make sure the data exists. Um, and we are starting to see, as particularly people scale, um, and they sort of buy into the promise of Hadoop and scale. We've got a retail for, retailer, for example, who is, you know, who is all their, um, you know, East Coast data is get, getting into a couple of data centers on the East. Their West Coast data is getting to West and, you know, a couple more in the center, right? And then what they do is they don't have the same data everywhere because it's too expensive. We're talking about, you know, tens and hundreds of terabytes. But they do keep aggregates of it everywhere. Um, so there's certainly some emerging use cases. Um, 
It's kind of early. To, I guess to your point, uh, yarn definitely, it's something that we kind of aptly think about, um, but that's probably going to look more like a Hadoop 3.0 yeah, solution. This is, so, yeah, what, to, what we do, what our customers do is kind of a mix of that, right? So they take half the data here, primary, secondary, half the data here, primary, secondary, because they still want the complete DR. But then you need recovery. another level of uh, and then, MapReduce. No, no, and then they, no, MapReduce runs within each data center, but... Then you need one more. So maybe not. Yeah, so, so in 2011, I'll, so I'll just uh, comment a little bit on that because we had done this. In 2011, uh, sorry, 2012 EMC World, we had demonstrated a prototype of something we called Worldwide Hadoop. Obviously, we could not use the name Hadoop, so we called it Worldwide Herd. Uh, that was essentially doing the same thing, right? I mean, there are, there are legal statutes in place where people cannot move data out of the country. There right? you go. So writing That's an application, you... but it's not a single YARN application. It basically provides the same interface, but underneath it actually splits it into however many number of clusters there are. Those many MapReduce or, or YARN applications, they actually run in place. The aggregation of that is basically then transferred over something that we called worldwide shuffle. That was actually our own implementation. We haven't seen many use cases of such things, though. Right? Is that an open source? Or your... It's not. It's not. Uh, uh, hopefully, we will someday when there are actually have this problem? I just, so I just saw a, on a Facebook try to solve that at the Hive level. So they had a Hive that can run across multiple data centers. And I recently, last week, I checked that link, and it says the project is abandoned. <laughs> I don't know why. So, so I, if anybody Facebook so, us here. So the have, way I've seen it used, right, is exactly where. So I used to work on Google search uh, before starting MapR. And like I would agree with Doug, is search is very amenable to it. So you find one data center getting very hot, you can start offloading to another data center. Google is expert in doing that, right? For that kind of, because the data is very static. It doesn't change that much. If the data is changing dynamically, it's going to be impossible to do what you just suggested. It cannot move that quickly. So that's the reason you want to move the processing where the data is. Yeah, so we are moving the processing where the data is with search, right? Because the data is not changing. Right. That for search, it's possible. For full text search. Okay. We have, a, we have a, so with our Platform Symphony product, which we actually manage multiple disparate data centers with, uh, we actually do that kind of resource management and moving processes of, across to specific data centers. But what they say is right, like you can't actually have one process executing across multiple data centers. You have to sort of move the execution to the appropriate data center based on workload and based on availability of resources, and then you can get the workload done there and then bring it back. That's, okay. that's what so, I'm saying so as well. That is I'm possible. That, that. So there are yeah. products, so if you go to good old grid management products, this is exactly what they do. Okay. So essentially, and this is where Yarn needs to evolve to, right? So ultimately, it's all grid management. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. File is here. So, uh, in order to uh, really democratize Hadoop, uh, people uh, other than software engineers have to use Hadoop, like product managers, uh, customer support professionals. So, right now, when I teach Hadoop to them, I have to teach a lot of uh, intricacies. I have to actually have to go through uh, like a small uh, software engineering course to do that. And uh, so, when will Hadoop uh, be something like I don't need a software engineering course to use it? Can you use, can you so, use Tableau? So <laughs> yeah, here's, here's use one Tableau. example, right? We are working on Apache Drill to make it a complete superset of SQL. So you can connect to Hadoop, and it's, and it's completely federated. There is no metadata store. It can, you can deal with self-described data or metadata stores. You can connect to it with Excel and directly say, okay, here's, here's the three data sources, combine them. It can do it without requiring three definition of any form of anywhere, whether it's JSON or whether it's you know, whatever else, or just plain text. So I think we're kind of getting there, but I think, uh, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? It's not always going to be that way. If and you looked at it, Hue, Hue has a, a lot of nice uh, graphical interfaces for different components. You know, you can browse a file system, you can compose Hive queries, um, you can compose search queries, um, uh, all in one, integrated. But, you know, if, if people are just using a, a GUI, um, how much are they learning about how these things work? I don't know. Uh, I, it's like my question is, do they really need to know? Because like, that, that's not part well, of I, the job to learn how to Well, I would, I would say it's slightly different, right? I would say it's, it's an incumbent upon us as Hadoop vendors and Hadoop projects to make sure that all the tools that you are familiar with, whether it's MicroStrategy, Tableau, Excel, SharePoint, you, you pick, right? Maybe it's SAP, maybe it's you know, a whole suite of IBM products or whatever it is, right? It'll be incumbent upon us to make sure 
those things, those tools continue to work with data in Hadoop. Exactly. Right? That's the way I would encourage you guys to look at it. Although, so to add to what Arun just said, right? this is what almost all the vendors, this is what I was mentioning that a lot of the vendors are starting to re-platform. Right? So yeah. you will see, you will see uh, for example, IBM's data stage, as you still use the same GUI, but it actually runs MapReduce underneath on, on a Hadoop cluster. Okay, we have this component called Big R, where an R programmer sits in their R studio, that's all. They don't even know that they actually have MapReduce running underneath, but it actually runs ex existing R construct right, right then and there, right? So that's, so you have to d also differentiate between the persona you're talking to, right? So if you're talking to a, to a R programmer, a statistician, all, he's very comfortable with R, but he may not be comfortable with a, with a, with a, with a graphical tool. But if you talk to an ETL programmer, they are extremely comfortable with, uh, or a report writer, they are extremely comfortable with the, with the, with the uh, graphical tools. So the graphical tools essentially needs to know how to push down that workload down to Hadoop. Okay, that is incumbent uh, on vendors to actually make that work. This is also related though to the point I said about having standard APIs, which is it's much easier for a vendor to provide these things if they know that they do at once and it runs on every Hadoop distribution, every big data storage system and so on. Uh, this is one of the reasons we've seen people interested in Spark actually. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, so topic for this panel discussion was beyond MapReduce, right? <laughs> I don't know uh, if that was really answered. <laughs> So my question is, who, anyone or all of you guys can paint a picture in your perfect 2020 vision, right? Beyond map reduce, what is it? Is it going to be an MPP database? Is it going to be a Spark? Is it going to yes. be a Tej? Is it going to be something else? From the consumer standpoint, what do you guys think is going to whole system going so to it's look going like? To be yes, 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 and yes, it's, and yes. It's, 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 a, it's a platform. <laughs> you can have all those. That's not an answer. Right? There's, there's no one tool to, that solves every problem. There are different, different kinds of tools solve different kinds of problems. Um, and you want to have a, a single platform that you can uh, explore data and find the tools which are most effective for the problems you have. So do you guys see any sort of a convergence of these different things happening together? I mean, like the stage is something, the, I mean, the point, mass park. One MPP point of convergence data. is the platform, the sort of OS level. Um, uh, other points of convergence are security, which is arguably, it should be part of the platform. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it would be nice if there were um, interfaces that were better integrated, and I think those are coming. Um, really so I, I don't think you, I mean, I, I think this notion of converging into one monolith um, is not very practical for something that's evolving and, um, and needs to evolve. That. Yeah, I don't think people want that either. You know, to answer your question differently, right? I mean, when I was growing up, I learned C, Perl, Python, a little bit of Python, right? Um, and we thought, you know, those are enough, right? There's C++, there's Java. But in the last three years, we've seen Go, Julia, um, I'm sure I'm missing, you know, a couple more, right? The answer is, you know, there's always going to be new stuff. There's going to be new use cases. There'll be, you know, so clever. So answer is a choice. That yeah, user exactly. Choice. The key part is for us, we don't want, we don't want to, I think if we don't evolve as a project and we don't provide people options at, to evolve, we will, you know, to Doug's point, we'll reach our final state of maturation. See, but one thing I just uh. want to point out, point out like, for example, relational database in last couple of decades, right, became the processing engine for for data, right? So for a big data, also something similar to that, like a, I can imagine a database management system. Underneath it can use Spark-like engine, Tage-like engine, or this thing. Is that something you guys think would be going to be like down the road? Because for a consumer, it's very difficult to, I mean, because well, ultimately, so, I mean, the enterprises let, let want me, to consume the data, right? Let, let and me, process let me the data. Let, let me comment on that, right? We have, we have, I come from a high-performance computing background. Right? So high performance computing people for the last 30 years, they have been building faster and faster machines, more, more you know, intricate programming frameworks and things like that. Right? The relational database or database management people for the last 40 years, they have been building you know, great stuff. Right? Why did big data even or all these you know, Hadoop-like systems even come into picture when these two 30-year-old technologies, they were not, you know, something that they were not satisfying. And that's why this 
thing came up, right? I, I, 2020, I mean, other than all of us being, you know, millionaires or whatever, it's basically, I, I see the future where there is going to be a choice of compute frameworks, right? Right now, in the next couple of years, it's going to explode. It's basically, there are going to be 20 different choices. It's going to boil down to three. Finally, everything boils down to three, right? <laughs> so it's going to boil down to three. We'll see which ones remain and which ones, uh, you know, go away. And, and, and just to like a, one one other point about we talk about big data, right? Yeah, so from one to three, one to three, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so it's three. It's not one. It's three. Ask again. Maybe like, will, it, will it be six or nine? <laughs> Each of those will become three right. again later. And this whole point of big data is also relative, right? I mean, what is big data for one person is different. I mean, we talk a lot about you know, we come from a background where terabytes. Some for some people, terabytes is a lot. Uh, petabyte is a lot. You go talk to people at CERN. These guys are generating petabytes per second. Right? And they don't know what to do with it. They usually just drop the data on the floor. Right? We're really talking about radio telescopes generating terabyte, petabytes per second. Right? Now, who knows, right? with Internet of Things or whatever it is, uh, you could have maybe all of us trying to generate that much data and process it. Right? Yeah. You know, the, the, the bar always moves higher. Um, I don't think there's a perfect evolution of you know, human evolu humans either. It's, until, you know, it's going to be a while. Similarly, technology is going to change. So, so another question on the side, like, uh, I always keep hearing the network is getting faster, network is improving. I mean, yeah. so the data locality in the context of HDFS, right, becomes less and less relevant, right? Uh, Most of the, to, I mean, I'm, I I'm, just, making, I'm just making a comment. I mean, you guys can answer later. Hard drives, and so, buses get, hard drives get bigger and buses get faster, too. So the, the, the network, if it were growing faster at a faster rate. But the map reduce doesn't consume but, the network at this beyond, point because it's still connection network, oriented. Beyond right? the network, you have memory, which is easily 100 times faster in terms of bandwidth. So it's not, there's always going to be a memory hierarchy and any system that needs to be efficient must exploit locality to. to I to see, my that. question was like, the, we, there are lots of enterprise grade file system already existing. Is that HDFS going to be just a protocol? that these file systems would adopt at the end, like mm. for example, GPFS in IBM, Isilon in EMC. I mean, there are many file systems and I see the trend that these file systems are kind of adopting the, the protocol of HDFS to get themselves uh, 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 basically compatible with the map reduce or this uh, new generation programming, well, I think right? There's certainly a possibility so where do you guys see this thing right? is going? So, so one of the things which, so you, you raise a valid point and, the, and I, okay, I'm going to sort of extend what you're saying. Okay. The problem in existing Hadoop clusters, which we have heard from customers, is you always provision for peak load. Okay. The average utilization of Hadoop cluster is pretty dismal if you look at the workloads which are running. Right. So one of the things which people always cite is yeah, and from, from. No, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, so one of the one of the things which people cite is I'm actually provisioning for either peak compute load or peak storage load. Right. So. Yes, there is, the, and you're right, there is enough, what you call, noise in the system right now where people can say I can use infinite band with uh, RDMA and uh, things like that, and I can actually have storage appliances underneath which actually can serve pretty much the same speed at which locally available data is there. NetApp makes one of them, right? Uh, the NOSH appliance which comes from NetApp is essentially one such attempt at doing that, okay? So, so th those are all, at attempts which are happening, but we have still not solved the kind of performance issues you get or performance benefits you get with data locality, especially when you are dealing with highly sparse data, right? When no, doesn't be sparse. I mean, there's one example I gave about when we asked about who's making money out of this, right? I said there's this query 25 table join, ran for three weeks on Teradata. That's all very high performance custom hardware underneath, all infinite band native verbs, everything, right? Well, actually, but they, the only, but the, only commodity, the only specialized hardware on Teradata today is Binet. Everything yes. else is commodity. commodity yeah. So, so we, are, we are moving from node local to rack local. Rack local. That, that yeah. is absolutely that is true, it. right? We're basically look at Intel's uh, plans in 2016, Crystal Ridge, memory is all rack local, storage is all rack local, right? So locality remains. Obviously, we are going to be data center local. Right, we are basically so moving I'm, from I'm node local to rack cloud local. computing era, where like if you see the Amazon or those clouds, right, where they actually try to have S3, Swift, or those kind of file systems, a more reliable file system, and HDFS is used more like a temporary file system. So I just wanted to get your views. So, so you, so you are, com you are combining two things. Okay, the 
the S3 type file systems are essentially block storage files, right? Fine. And so the fact is, you you didn't in in the cloud you do need a persistent layer. That's why that is present. Okay. In this case, in the case of uh, so for us to actually get rid of the S3s and the Swifts of the world, you need something which actually scales out independent of the compute workload. That's the idealism for the cloud guys. Okay. But I don't think we are there as yet. Okay, because one, of one the last point about you know you know rack itself, right? I mean, if you look at Moonshot, <laughs> Moonshot is 1600 <laughs> nodes. What, what is the number? It's like 1400 or 1600 per rack, right? I mean, hardware keeps changing too, right? And you know, I know several people who are using Flash. They don't use the you know C SATA protocols. They use the QPI protocol, which is the protocol used between the Intel processors on their chip. Right. So, Things change a lot. Locality so I'll to, I'll to cut you off. Uh, We have a lot of other questions to get to. Thank you very much. Hi. So my question is uh, particularly about uh, 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 architecture called as Lambda architecture, and uh, I'm seeing that that's coming more and more uh, in the customers which we are talking about, and I also see that uh, Spark uh, seems to be an ideal solution in that case because it takes care of both the batch processing side and the uh, stream processing side. So my first question would be. Uh, you know, how common are you seeing Lambda architecture as coming up as a you know, common pattern across uh, the industry? You see a lot of that in blog posts. Uh, actual <laughs> implementations actually are, are not that common, right? Okay. But having the same system for doing batch and stream processing and serving, right, mm -hmm. all three, that's where I think each of us are, are going to, right? So, uh, MapReduce for batch, for example, for interactive queries, something like uh, Hawk or Impala or High Vantage, right? And then we have Storm on Yarn and other yeah. other streaming platforms there. Right? So th things are getting there. We are we are seeing right now people have a lot of mission critical workloads in the non batch uh, uh, okay. non batch workloads, right? Those are those are treated as as mission critical. They do not want to bring those directly on a system which they feel like is is less mature. As the systems mature, I think they will be comfortable in moving those workloads here as well. So actually, next week, if you're going to the Hadoop Summit, Michael Hausenblas from MapR is talking about the Lambda architecture, giving a presentation there. We have a lot of customers using that. He'll mm -hmm. talk about that. I think you should probably go and attend yeah. this talk. Right, so you have uh, some of so the... There, there's a lot of people who are combining that flow, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, you have some, need. so you have some alternatives of, uh, apart from Spark um, in that talk? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. So that's what I wanted to know. Thank yeah. you. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, Hadoop as the data center OS. I see that there's a lot of convergence coming down the years between Hadoop, where it's going with Yarn and OpenStack and Docker and all of those spaces. Uh, can you speak a little bit about where you see Hadoop going in I this mean, space? So, so Docker is a really good example, right? I mean, we're starting to see a lot of these PaaS-like platforms. Um, you know, there is definitely this Lambda architecture. It's, you know, definitely it's on blog posts. You can see a lot of them. People are starting to do some of it. And equally importantly, people want to use uh, an interface they're already familiar with. It might be cascading, it might be Hive, it might be Pig, it might be Spark, right? They want to use it for more than one thing. And I mean, that's the, the whole idea of Yarn, which was to make sure that we can do much more than you know, one thing. Because if we remained a one-trick pony, we wouldn't get there. Um, Altiscale, which is a Hadoop as a service platform, uh, those guys have been doing a lot of work with Docker and Yarn. Um, you should probably see them at the summit next uh, next week. Um, so, absolutely, there is. A, you know, we recently started this work called Apache Slider, which helps us run uh, HBase, Accumulo, Storm, what have you, on top of Yarn. Um, there's definitely a lot of demand because people want eventually want to use, you know, one 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 platform where they can look at storage and compute resources and then divvy them up um, in a more dynamic fashion um, between different workloads. So absolutely. I, I, see, I see a significant difference between uh, scheduling and managing stateful applications versus stateless applications, right? And for stateful applications, yes, Yarn and, and Hadoop is great. For stateless applications, I think something lightweight, something more uh, suited for, let's say, a, a containerized uh, you know platform that's a virtualized and containerized platform i think that's where stateless applications are going to be deployed more and more often so in in the short term i'd i'd or, or maybe 
whatever I can see, I, I don't I don't actually see those two platforms uh, merging, right? Mm -hmm. Slider will be used for stateful applications, especially with a, something like Apache Helix for or Helix on Yarn for managing or uh, distributing I mean, the states. That doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't I want to run, for example, Elasticsearch through Yarn? It's it's more or less stateless. Right? And I like contains its own indexes, right? Yes, but Stores. this index what? doesn't change rapidly. What's it's lucid. What is the stateless app? What a stateless app basically does it only maintains a cache and actually corrects to storage outside, state outside. What is outside? That's stateless. So outside, is outside of the read app only? itself. Uh, outside mean, of Hadoop. Stateless so read app only? server and database server, right? That's that's the architecture I'm talking about. Sure. Yes. There, are re there is a reason that that's database the servers state. did not become application servers. Application servers remained separate. Database servers remained separate. Right? I mean, That's I, what I'm talking While about. not disagreeing with you, right? Well, in, in the Hadoop context, mm -hmm. a database is probably HBase. So you have stayed in HBase and you serve that state off right. um, HBase. Yeah, but yeah. you could still. Okay. It's it, so not very so useful that, if there's that, no state, right? That, that brings me to the point I mean, of the single no scheduler aspect. You yeah. need multiple schedulers. So look at what Google is doing with their Omega, which is that multiple schedulers talking to resource state database to schedule multiple different types of frameworks. So long running applications, interactive queries, and batch oriented queries, right? These exactly. three are going to need three different. <laughs> <laughs> you got it? <laughs> three different kinds of schedulers. Glad you just mentioned uh, Google. I mean, every time we talk about Hadoop, they always, everyone have to um, uh, bring up the Google paper. And then I, um, but on, in public, uh, not, um, we haven't really seen uh, Google deploy how many know how many know how to cluster so I bet they they have some uh, the secret sources to handle big data processing so uh, are you guys sure that how is the way to go to handle big data or Google way that will be the the, the way to go so if you Google work for saw, Google yeah maybe. Google bought a company called uh, Motorola right sometimes or, or and and their applications were actually running uh, on Hadoop so in that acquisition, they did not make them port their applications onto the Google MapReduce framework. They actually ran a Hadoop cluster for Motorola in their own data center. Yeah. So yes, Google ran MapReduce, or, or Google ran Hadoop. So, so I, the, the Google reference here is actually somewhat different, right? The Google has a scale and the way of doing things. They encounter many of these problems before most other people do because of the scale of the size of things they run. So, and they are very smart engineers. So it's, good to you know copy things that smart people do right and and you know i love copying a smart idea i really love it and so i think i think this is a so you watching what they're doing kind of gives you a good watching what apple does gives you a good clue of what should you expect next i think you take some hints from people who have encountered this problem before and spend some considerable effort trying to solve them Right. And, and similarly, Hadoop has improved a lot thanks to some, somebody like Yahoo, right? Because Yahoo pushed it so early. You know, Yahoo, Facebook, eBay, LinkedIn, whatever. These guys push Hadoop so so fast, and so Facebook. early. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and that's you know that's why it's as good as it is today. Because otherwise, we don't have real use case and real experience. Exactly. You know, it doesn't really matter. And Yahoo did a fantastic job of it. I would say. Yeah. Hi. We have one uh, more one more quick question. Yeah, this, this will be quick. I feel really bad asking this question right over here, but 70% um, of my conversation with prospects, customers using Hadoop, advanced Hadoop users, guys who want to adopt Hadoop for all the benefits it offers, one of the, the fastest thing they get after you know, understanding what it is, they ask me, can we use Hadoop as a cheap storage solution? What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'd say, I mean, even more than that, I'd say that this is the thing that it, it excelled at as first. And now that the storage is in there, people want to do more. And that's why we're having the discussion today. It's people are discovering that a lot of the things you built on specialized systems before, you can do on the same commodity machines that you are using for cheap storage. Yeah. And there's even a fancy term for that. It's called active archiving. So essentially, that's what starts to happen, right? Because uh, it, people say, okay, I have this extremely costly storage mechanisms and processing mechanisms. I want to actually, don't want to discard the data, but I want to start pushing the data. So that's how the lake got formed originally. And then people started to put more into the lake from the other side. 
Yeah, just just not for the cold data sets. Yeah. You you want you want to use Hadoop for as a storage system for warm, warm data. Warm data sets. Yeah. yeah, tier one. Yeah, they want to use for tier one. But the question tier is, one. does it have all the reliability that enterprise storage solutions bring? And and that's where, you know, the the conversation start to kind of we're not very sure about. So right. if you go talk to Facebook today, they'll tell you they have a single HDFS cluster with 100 petabytes of data, right? I've not seen that in any other system other than HDFS. And I don't think they're losing data. I mean, I think the, the if you're asking about reliability yeah. in particular, um, uh, early on, Yahoo did a, a pretty exhaustive study, which you can probably find the report somewhere on the, on the web about, uh, you know, had they experienced any data loss? Um, and this is all, you know, in the early years of Hadoop. And the answer was basically no. They'd experienced data loss when they'd run it in unsafe um, uh, configurations. Configurations where you risk data loss uh, knowingly were the only cases where they actually had any data loss. So um, I, I think there's a, there's a pretty good track record. It's only gotten stronger. Yeah, and specifically in this case, the data loss were, was files which had one replication, replica one, which. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give it all for uh, our moderator and our panelists. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all.